Thanks for tuning in to this week's online chapel. This week, we get to hear from Dr. J.D. Greer, who currently serves as our Southern Baptist Convention president and is also a close friend of Dr. Thomas, our university president. In addition to serving as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Dr. Greer is the pastor at the Summit Church in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Greer completed his PhD in theology at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary and shortly after served as an International Mission Board missionary in Southeast Asia. Pastor J.D. and his wife, Veronica, live in Raleigh, where they raise four children, Karis, Alethea, Raya, and Aiden. Dr. Greer is offering a free gift to the first 300 students who text in and follow the information that he gives at the front of the video. So, for the first time in chapel history, I'm giving you permission. Take out your phone, have it handy, and follow the instructions for an awesome free gift from Dr. Greer. Well, hello students at OBU. Before I get started, I have commercials. First, from the North American Mission Board, uh, you got a water bottle, and also a little devotional workbook that is a companion to my new book coming out next month. It's called, called What Are You Going to Do With Your Life? It's a book that basically just helps you ask, um, how has God gifted you and, and what are you gonna do with your life? What's the difference in a, a life that is wasted and a life that is lived in a way that you will never regret? You can get a free copy of that book, a free copy by texting GOING, G-O-I-N-G, to the number 88123. That's GOING to 88123, and they will send you a free copy. Man, by the way, North American Mission Board figured nobody would actually buy my book, so they would have to give it away. But um, it's only for the first 300 people who text in, so, uh, so don't wait. In fact, pull out your phone right now and text GOING to 88123, and they will send you a free copy. Uh, let me just say that I am so incredibly honored um, I've heard so many things here about your university. Um, I never had a chance to be there, but your president is a good friend. He was an elder at our church when he was here in, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and he is a great leader. It's my joy to be able to speak to you at such a, a critical time of your life also. Um, our church, the Summit Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, we've got a lot of college students within about a... Uh, about a 20 mile radius of where I'm standing right now. Uh, they say there are about 120,000 college students. Usually uh, during COVID, it might be a little different, but a lot of those come to our church on the weekend, which I always say means a couple of things about us. Uh, number one, we are dirt poor as a congregation, as I'm sure uh, you understand. College students bring a lot of things to the church, but money is not usually one of them. Uh, back when students first started to come to our church um, several years ago, I remember the Sunday that uh, five of them pulled up in a Honda Accord and a Toyota Camry. They parked in the fire lane, they got out, they came in the service, they were late of course, and I guess they enjoyed it because they came back the next week, uh, this time with about 500 of their friends. Uh, by the way, I think they, they got out of the same Honda Accord, all of them, and the same Toyota Camry, just all they just kept piling out. And during that season in our church's life, our attendance basically tripled and our average weekly giving went down down during that time, uh, about $2.48. So in fact, one of my favorite memories as a pastor involves a college student. Uh, one of our ushers came into my little backstage area in between two of the services and he had an offering bucket and in it, in it was a bacon, egg and cheese biscuit um, from a college student from McDonald's. Um, and a little note on the biscuit that said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. Uh, so um, we uh, don't have a lot of money as a church, relatively speaking, a lot of um, you know, per capita giving, but we do have a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of young adults thinking about what to do with their lives. Um, it's a very unusual time for you to be in college, you know this, and to be thinking about your career. Here's why, Acts 17 says that God rearranges the borders of nations for the purposes of the gospel so that people far from him can seek him. You can begin to see all of geopolitics that God is doing this to give people an exposure to the gospel. And that means that in moments like this, God uses those to rearrange the world for his purposes. You realize this coronavirus crisis is just too big a moment for God to waste. He's doing something. And it's no accident, you should know this, that he brought you into this university at this moment to think about what you're doing with your life. I would like to help you think about that and, and, and what are you doing with your life? That book is, is a way to do that. So I'd love for you to get a copy on us. I also wanna to talk to you about that from your theme passage for the year which is Colossians 1, verses 24 through 29. Uh, Dr. Thomas told me that was your theme passage, and so I asked him if I could just 
actually walk you through that passage. So Colossians 1, if you got your Bible, um, Colossians 1, I take it out and turn it on and scroll down to Colossians 1 if you're super cool like that. Um, as you're turning there, I'll tell you, um, I, I once heard a story about a, a, an old grandfather who was sitting out in the country on a, a front porch of his house with his grandson. There were about 10 dogs uh, there on the farm there asleep under the porch. And um, all of a sudden, one of those dogs perks up, ears perk up. He looks out across the field. He lets out a single bark, a little yap, and he tears out across the field. Well, all the other dogs kind of rouse from their slumber, the other nine, and they start barking and yapping and tearing out after this one dog. Well, the grandfather watching this whole thing turns to his grandson and says, says, says boy, let me tell you what's about to happen. He said, in just a minute, in just a minute, um, about 10 minutes, one by one, each one of those dogs is going to come back and they're going to you know, have their tongue hanging out and their head hung down and, and they're going to take their place back onto the porch and they're going to they're gonna go to sleep. He said in about 30 minutes, in about 30 minutes, that first dog is going to come back and he's going to have a rabbit in his mouth, a dead rabbit in his mouth. He said, you want to know why that one dog is going to get the rabbit? He said, it's not because he's fastest or smartest, it's because he's the only one that actually saw the rabbit. All the other dogs were just running and yapping and, and barking because somebody else was running and yapping and barking and it looked exciting. Um, the key, the key to endurance, what makes you go the distance is to see the rabbit. So when you, we ask a question like, why is it that some people make it in the Christian life? I'm assuming by the fact that you started here at OBU that, 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 that you at least you, you want to follow Jesus. But if you haven't figured this out yet, let me tell you, following Jesus is hard. It's difficult. And the only way for you to make it is going to be in what you see. Well, see, I say that because verses 24 through 29 of Colossians 1 are Paul's explanation of what he sees. You're going to get a glimpse into the heart of, uh, of the man who, who probably ran harder for Jesus than anybody else in history. All right? These verses that we're going to look at, they're, they're, they're pretty hard to put into a tight little outline because Paul is just throwing out things in a stream of consciousness that that, that move him and motivate him. If I were a genius like your president, your exalted excellency president, the erudite Dr. Thomas, I could probably come up with a catchy little outline, um, but I'm not a genius like him, so I'm just gonna walk you through it. In fact, um, this is not great, what they call homiletic skill, but almost like we're on one of those big bus city tours. If you've ever done it in a big city where the bus just stops and the, the guide points out a few things you know, around and then you move on. Um, there's not really any rhyme or reason. You're just kind of taking a tour through the city and a lot of cool stuff you don't want to miss. Um, that's what we're going to do with this passage. And then when we get to the end, if we pull back into the station, so to speak, I'm going to give you some reflection questions based on that that I think are really pertinent for you at this time of your life. Okay? Okay, you ready? All right, here we go. Verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. All right, stop. Look, I know we just left the station. But this statement was really confusing to the Colossians and probably is to you as well when you think about it. You rejoice in your sufferings, Paul? Was Paul just so spiritual that suffering didn't move him anymore? He's just so above it all that he didn't care about trivial things like freedom and friendship and health and family and creature comforts. No, that's not it at all. That's, in fact, that's more of a, a Buddhist approach to suffering. You're just so detached from life that, that you don't care what happens. And I'll tell you, there's a pseudo, a false pseudo piety um, in the church that acts like spiritual people just don't care about nice stuff or comforts or close relationships. Again, that's Buddhist, that's not Christian. If anything, being a Christian makes you love those things more because following Jesus heightens your love of people and your enjoyment of creation. What Paul is talking about is having a, a joy in what you gain through suffering that is greater than the pain of what you give up in suffering. And if you're writing stuff down, maybe write this down. Joyful sacrifice, Christian life, is giving up something you love for something you love even more. And Paul loved seeing people come to Christ. He loved seeing people moved out of poverty. He loved to see people grow in Christ even more than he loved his personal freedoms or creature comforts. You rejoice in suffering when you love what you gain through suffering more than what you, what you give up in suffering. And see... Listen, without that love, without that consuming, driving joy, without that captivating vision, you will never endure in the difficult parts of the Christian life. Because following Jesus means sometimes you're going 180 degrees opposite of where, of where the desires of your heart 
want you, you think you want to go. I, I've heard it uh, compared, I've heard ministry like this compared sometimes to childbirth. Before the birth of our first child, people always told me, um, oh, childbirth, it's so beautiful. Um, having been present now during four childbirths, I can tell you that there ain't a lot of beautiful about the birth process itself. Honestly, it's kind of scary. Um, I was you know, standing there in the first one, I'm like, oh, when does the beautiful part start? Is this all supposed to be happy? That does not look natural. You see that and you think, well, who would go through all of that voluntarily? Who would even call it beautiful? And almost every mom in the world would say, would say, would say, I would. I would call it beautiful. They would wave away the thought of their suffering and say to the child, if that's what it took to bring you into the world, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. It's totally worth it. Paul said to the Colossians, this is how I feel about you spiritually, how I feel about your soul, how I feel about what's happening in you, the fact that I'm going to spend eternity with you. I rejoice in my suffering for you because of what I know it is producing in you. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll pay whatever price I got to pay for you to know Jesus. Paul knew, you see, that it was joy that drove Jesus to the cross for him. Hebrews 12 too, right? For the joy set before him, which was mine and your salvation, Jesus endured the cross with joy because he could see the fact that he was gaining you and me through it. That's what drove Paul now for others. Joyful sacrifice, again, the Christian life is giving up something you love for something you love even more. And this joy, this joy is the only thing that will sustain you in mission. Without it, you'll never make it. So Paul says, far from being discouraged by these sufferings, I rejoice because of what it produces in you. And I've given up something I love, creature comforts, for something I love even more, which is, which is, is, is seeing Christ in you. In the next verse, Paul takes it up even a level, all right? In fact, he says, he says, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. Now, on the surface, y'all, that is a staggering statement. What could possibly, think about it, what could possibly be lacking in Christ's affliction? Didn't Jesus say from the cross, weren't like one of his final words there, it is finished? Hadn't he done everything necessary to save us? Didn't he sit down at the right hand of God because it was done? How could Paul say something then was lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, in one sense, the work of salvation is complete. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. But in another sense, you understand the saving act itself is not complete until, until somebody hears about what Jesus did and responds. Martin Luther very famously said, it would not matter if Jesus died a thousand times if nobody ever heard about it. Or Carl F.H. Henry, who was another theologian, he said, you know, the gospel is only good news for somebody if it gets to them in time. Paul says Christ's sufferings are not complete in the fullest sense until you hear and respond. And if it takes my suffering to bring that to pass, then that's, that's suffering I'll gladly go through. And I love the way that one um, Romanian pastor um, says it. He said, Christ's cross was for propitiation. Ours is for propagation. Christ suffered to accomplish salvation. We suffer to spread salvation. Listen, let me give you a, a hard and rather unpopular teaching. Suffering is the appointed means by which God has ordained bringing salvation in the world. Right? We, want, we want God's salvation to come through prosperity and blessing. I remember hearing a, um, a TV preacher, uh, I think it was from Florida. Um, uh, he was on TV and I just was flipping through the channels and I caught him and he had a big old smile and he was talking to everybody and he said, hey, you know, uh, some of you, have, your credit card's almost maxed out. And he says, if you've got any room left on that credit card, he said, God has told me that if you will give $1,500 to this ministry, even if it maxes out your credit card, then um, he said, then, 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 then he's going to bless you financially. And he said, you know, in, in six months, maybe a year, you'll be out of debt and uh, you'll be driving that new BMW and people will see you driving down the street with that smile on their face and uh, a smile on your face. And they'll say, wow, amazing. Look how awesome God is. And I remember sitting there, first of all, I was so mad. I, I was like, you know, Lord, is it okay that I want to go down and punch this guy in the throat? Is that spirit filled? But um, I was, uh, look, and I just thought that's not, why would that be amazing to people? If you're driving a new BMW and you got a smile on your face, anybody smiles in that situation. What amazes people, what directs them to the gospel is when nothing is going right. You're not driving a new BMW and, and you're going through suffering, yet still you're able to say, I've got a joy that comes from something that that life can't take away, that death cannot touch. 
And that's what Jesus said, that, that he was sending us out. Yes, we're praying for blessing, of course, but, but Jesus said, as the Father sent me, that's how I'm sending you. And how did the Father send Jesus into the world? He sent him into the world to bring salvation through suffering. So he now sends us. Just as Jesus brought salvation into the world through suffering, so we extend Jesus' salvation in the world through suffering. Write this down. Life in the world only comes through death in the church. Life in the world only comes through death in the church. Here's a question you're going to be asked over and over again in the Christian life. The circumstances are going to present this question to you. Is this a price you're willing to pay? Is this a price you're willing to pay? Are you willing to, to enter into that suffering if it means other people coming to know Jesus? In fact, let me ask you, think about this. What did it cost you to receive the free gift of salvation? The answer is nothing, right? No, Jesus paid it all. All right, the follow-up question is, well, then you are, are you now willing to do whatever it takes for people all over the world to know that message? Because just as salvation came to us through his cross, news of that message comes to them through our cross. For some of you, by the way, this may be more than just, than just a, a theory. Um, when I uh, was a missionary in Southeast Asia, uh, it was a part of a, a Muslim part of the world, and one of their big holidays, uh, they commemorate it by, by um, sacrificing a bull. And uh, I'd never seen anything like this. Um, we were everybody dressed in white. They kind of put me up because I was a guest, and they put me right up on the front row. I was probably two and a half, three feet from this bull. These seven men, seven of them were holding this bull down. And um, this, I guess their version of a priest comes out and he has a knife. And y'all, it was the most gruesome thing I, I think I'd ever seen. They began to cut into the neck of that, the, that animal and that animal kicked and thrashed. And that priest kept muttering his prayers, cutting into that. And, and, and y'all, I'm telling you, blood went everywhere. I mean, it covered the men, it covered me. And the worst part was for about a minute after he'd done that, that animal just laid there and kicked and wheezed and died. Um, almost as eerie as watching it happen was the silence when it, it suddenly just stopped breathing. And I remember standing there, and it was one of those moments where the Holy Spirit just sort of kind of opened my eyes to a couple things. One, this was a sacrifice. This is what God gave Israel as a picture of what Jesus was going to do. That moved me to, to worship. But then... The Holy Spirit sort of dropped in my heart, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that I urge you to present your body a living sacrifice. And I thought, this is the image that God chose for my life when, when he said, this is what it's going to look like for you to follow me. Take up your cross. Are you ready for that to be the picture of your life? I mean, I, I'm used to thinking of the Christian life as, you know, victory running across the finish line with my hands in the air. But, but was, it, was I ready for that to be a picture of of my life. Little did I know, by the way, that just a couple months later, I'd be put to the test on that. We had a situation um, where I served that where some team members from a local, um, from just some of our, our, our partners were distributing Bibles in our area when a, a mob collapsed on them and put them into um, prison. They, they burned their cars down. Uh, the police uh, were, were trying to figure out how to resolve this. They knew they were connected to us, so they came after us, and they, they put us under house arrest. And to make a long story short, it was about two weeks there that I was kind of right on the edge and didn't really know what what was going to happen and I was afraid it was one of the first times I'd ever been truly afraid for my my life and I can tell you it is one thing to say that you're ready to give your life for Jesus it's quite another when you think somebody's there to actually take you up on that offer um, I mean the situation eventually things kind of tensions eased up the mobs kind of died down and, and we were allowed to, to go back out in the community but um, I got released uh, from house arrest, and my travels took me to the very place where this riot had happened. And I remember crossing over, and I remember getting very, my, my, my palms were sweaty, and I was nervous because I thought somebody was going to come back and say, you, you're connected to this. And all of a sudden, I look up, and uh, I just, I don't know why, but my eyes just fixated on the, on the bus driver. I didn't know who it was, just a, a local man there. And I remember thinking, this is a man made in the image of God. And this man has no way to hear the gospel except for me and my, my roommate who had moved there to, to share the gospel. And the Holy Spirit just put in my heart this question, is this man worth it? And I can't promise you that you're never going to encounter suffering. I can't promise you you'll make it out of here alive, but is his soul worth it? Where would you be had Jesus not given his life for you? The answer is you'd be at exactly the same place that man is without you, without somebody to share the message. Friends, isn't that what we owe to the gospel? Isn't that what we owe to the gospel? Where would you and I be without Jesus? The answer is we'd be in the exact same place millions of people are in the world without us because 
it does no good for Jesus to die for them if, they, if they've never heard about it. How could we receive the extravagant grace of the gospel and do nothing to get it to those who've never heard? Don't we owe it to them? After I'd lived there in Southeast Asia for a few months, I got a call one night, it was about midnight, and uh, a friend of mine who was a believer, one of the only believers I knew in the area, lived about three hours south of me. Uh, he was from that, that, that country. He said, hey, J.D., he said, he said, uh, he said I, 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 have, I need your help. I have somebody that I want you to meet. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, you know, I can't. He says, you know they're listening. And it was true. They had our phones bugged. And so uh, he said, meet me at the place. I knew where he was talking about. So I got on a bus, traveled through the middle of the night, went to this little place to, to meet him. And there I was introduced to a guy named Fajar. Fajar was a 32-year-old, 32-year-old Muslim man. And uh, he didn't speak any English. And at this point, I didn't speak much of his language. And so my friend sort of translated for us. And this guy said, he said, I, um, he said, I had, about a month ago, he said, I had a dream. He goes, I think you would call it a dream. I don't know. He said, in this dream, I was standing in this field. As far as I could see, in front of me, behind me, to the right, to the left, he said, there was nothing. I walked for what felt like days in the middle of this field. Um, he said, all of a sudden, I heard a voice behind me in the midst of these, these journeys. And I turned and he said, there was a man. He said he had face like the sun. It shone in brilliance like the sun. And uh, he called my name and he reached inside of his robe and he pulled out a copy of the Injil. That's their word for gospel. And he said, he reached it out to me and said, Fajar, this is the only thing that will get you out of this field. He said, I pulled my hands back because I'm a Muslim. And he said, I knew that I could not touch that. And so he said, I said, no. He said, immediately I woke up and I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. He said, the next night I went to sleep and I had the exact same dream. He said, again, I walked for what felt like days through this field, like I was just wandering. He said, that's kind of how I felt about my life. And again, he appeared and he called my name. He said, this time I was curious. I wanted to take the copy of the gospel that he was offering me. He said, but I couldn't work up the courage. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't seem to make my hands reach out to take it. He said, I stood there in front of him for a long time. And then eventually he said, I just woke up. And I, again, I felt like I'd made a terrible mistake. He said, third night, I didn't even want to go, I didn't, I didn't even want to, go to sleep. And he, said, he said, but I did. And he said, as soon as I closed my eyes and sleep, there he was standing in this field. This time he just was standing there with it, reached out to me, and he said, Fajar, this is the only thing that will get you out of this field. He looks at me and he says, now my friend tells me that you are expert, expert at Injil. He said, uh, can you tell me what my dream means? Now listen, I grew up in a very conservative Baptist home. Right? I went to a conservative Baptist Bible college for my first year of college. I, um, you know, like I've been in Baptist churches. Dreams and the interpretation thereof are not part of our spiritual repertoire, but I'm happy to tell you that in that moment, I knew exactly what to say. I was like, Fajar, you are so in luck. Dream interpretation is my spiritual gift, right? And so I spent the next two, two and a half hours walking him through literally Genesis through Revelation stories to show him how the Messiah had come to die for him. I'll never forget, I got to that part um, in the New Testament where we're going through Matthew and we're leading up to Jesus's death. And he says, so you were saying that this is God who is dying for me? And I said, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. And then he gets these big tears in his eyes and he just kind of tear rolled down and he kind of held up his hands. He said, Allahu Akbar, which is like, you know, God is the greatest. And I was like, well, okay, we got some discipleship to do, but you know, I get the sentiment that he's saying. Um, I completed my little gospel presentation and I said, Fajar, do you want to become a Christian? Do you want to follow Jesus? And he said, oh, with all my heart, and I was like, well, I only know one way to do this. So every head bowed, every eye closed. And I started to lead him in, in, in the sinner's prayer. And uh, I got about two phrases into that sinner's prayer. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to be saved. I'm ready to receive you. And I was like, stop, Fajar, wait a minute. You understand this is a big deal. You understand that, that when you pray this, you're going to become a believer and we're going to baptize you. And if you get baptized, you know that you might lose your job or you might be estranged from your family or you might get killed. There are people in this region who have been killed because they became followers of Jesus. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Never forget, he, he kind of paused for a minute. He got this big smile on his face and he said, of course. He said, of course. He said, why do you think it took me a month to come to work up the courage to come and talk to you? He said, I was afraid. He said, but during that, that month, I decided, I knew that you were going to say that that one in that dream was Jesus. 
And I knew what you Christians said about Jesus. And I determined in that month that if Jesus really was God and that he had died for me, then there's not anywhere that I wouldn't go with him no matter what I had to leave behind. For every follower of Jesus, there's something in you when you hear a story like that that rises up in you and you just say, yes, yes, Vajar, he's worth it. Well, let me just ask you, okay? It's true, the cost to follow Jesus in places like Southeast Asia is severe. The cost to get the gospel to places like Southeast Asia is severe. And the Jesus who is worth Fajar's life, the eternity, is also a Jesus who's worth paying whatever cost we got to pay to get the gospel to them. Man, that's what Paul is wrestling with here. What's it worth? Let's keep moving because we're almost done, okay? Paul says, verse 25, I have become the church's servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, to make the word of God fully known. All right, that word commission, underline it if you got your pen out, it means an individual assignment, something given specifically to you. And what's key about that is to understand that God doesn't just have this great big global mission that he assigns to the church at large. You see, he also has an individual assignment, a commission for you. It's just for you. He's got a purpose for your time and your talents and your treasures in the church, through the church, a commission for you. And it's the kind of thing where if you don't do it, it doesn't get done, right? And other people suffer because you weren't there playing your part. I read somewhere, listen to this, that the denomination that does the best job mobilizing its people for mission is Pentecostals. I thought it'd be Baptist because I thought missions is our thing, right? All the famous missionary heroes are Baptist and a lot of the great mission speakers are Baptist, but it's the Pentecostals. And this article that I was reading said the reason is because Baptists talk about the lostness of the world. Pentecostals focus on the spirit and his empowering and his specific calling on your life. And this article said evidently being gift driven is more compelling and empowering than being guilt driven. Do you know the Holy Spirit shows up in the book of Acts 59 times? 59. In 36 of the 59, he is speaking. He's talking. He's guiding the church. He's giving individual assignments. Here's the question. Are you listening? Are you, have you received your commission yet for what you're supposed to do? I don't know. It's not everybody's going to go into ministry like, like I do, like a professional minister. But God has called all of you to leverage your gifts for the kingdom of God. We often say that the call to leverage your life for the Great Commission was included in the call to follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men, right? That means, means when you accepted Jesus, you accepted the call to mission. The question is no longer if you're called. The question now is where and how. So if you're good at, you know, dentistry or architecture or education or some kind of business, right? You're just as called to ministry in one sense as I am. Because what it means to follow Jesus is whatever you're good at, you do that well to the glory of God, but you also do it somewhere strategic for the mission of God. By the way, right, part of this, this book that I wrote, one of the challenges I give in it is called the, the go-to challenge. Go2years.net right, is, is where it talks about that. It's a challenge to take at least two years of your life after you graduate to go on one of a church plants through the North American Mission Board or the International Mission Board Right to, to even if you have a career, you're starting to start it in a place where God's doing something strategic. You got to get a job somewhere, right? Why not get a job in a place where God is doing something strategic? Why wouldn't the mission of God be the largest factor in where you choose to pursue your career? Isn't that what it means to follow Jesus? Right, that's what Paul's talking about. Well, I think I better I got to wrap up. Okay, so we pull back into the bus um, station, metaphorically speaking. There's two primary questions I think for you to ask right now. Number one. Number one, do you see your life as an extension of Christ's suffering? Have you offered yourself to him as a sacrifice? Are you ready for that sacrifice to be the picture of your life? Ever offered yourself like that to God? Number two, have you asked God what your commission is? And are you genuinely listening to him? Are you really surrendered? Uh, when I was um, your age, they used to talk about offering a blank check to God. A blank check. You know, a check was, uh, you, you remember what this is? You know what a check is? It's this thing ancient used to use back when you had horses and buggies and all kind of stuff. You'd get you'd, a little like blank piece of paper and you'd write somebody's name on it, had the name of your bank and your account number. You'd sign it. Well, here's the deal. Um, if you didn't know how much money you owed the person because, you know, whatever, they were going to buy something for you, sometimes you give them a blank check. But you always felt weird doing that because they could fill in any amount of money they wanted. And you're like, what if, you know, what if they use this moment to empty my account and, you know, run for California or whatever? Um, well, 
a blank check gives them total and complete authority over you, right? I much prefer to give somebody a gift card. A gift card had an assigned amount of money on it, right? And they could, when they spent that amount of money, then it was done. When God calls you, he didn't want a gift card. He didn't want your obedience in a few areas. He wants a blank check. He's either going to be Lord of all or not Lord at all. Have you ever offered your life as a blank check to God and said, God, it all belongs to you? Every future relationship, all my career choices, everything is yours, right? I've already signed my name. It's total surrender. Because, friend, listen, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. You and I both know it's possible to be at a Christian university and never have offered your life to God that way, right? Are you willing to, to put your life down at the altar and say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Listen again, like I said, I'd love to help you unpack this more. If you'll just text GOING to 88123 or go to go 2 and consider going on a church plant with IMB or, or, or NAM, then we can do that, okay? Let's pray. Let's all bow our heads if we would. And um, if you right now need to surrender your life to Christ, would you just say, Lord Jesus, here I am at a Christian university, but I don't know if I've ever given myself fully to you, and I do that right now. No conditions, no strings attached. In Jesus' name. And hey, if you're right now feeling like, I think God might be calling me to ministry, to, to give my life, to pay the price, to take the gospel to people around the world, would you just say to him, Lord Jesus, I don't know where this is going to go, but if that's what you're saying to me, I say yes. I surrender right now. I'm going to put my yes on the table and let you put it on the map. Father, I pray for those in the first and second category. Give them the wisdom and the courage to follow through. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made either of those two decisions, make sure you talk to somebody before this evening's over. Tell your president. I know he'd love to hear it. Some of your professors, maybe a, a resident assistant, or I'm not sure um, what they're called there. But tell somebody. Tell somebody so they can pray with you and, and see what God has for you.